So let's talk about a do-it-yourself 9-inch rear-end housing for an early 65-66 Mustang. However, this technique can also be used for virtually any 9-inch housing that you're wanting to narrow up. Greetings fellow DIYer and welcome to my video. So I am once again bringing you a video with little to no video. This project was done years ago. I've actually done it a couple of times. And in both cases, I was able to take pictures, but I did not have a YouTube channel at the time to be shooting video for. So what you're about to see is going to be images stitched together and me narrating over the top with the process that I went through to narrow up a Ford 9 inch for a 6566 Mustang. I have a full web page on this build, and that web page is going to have a lot more detail than what I'm going to give you in this video. So if you want to get down to the nitty gritty and, and really have a detailed description of everything that needs to be done, make sure you check out that page. So the first question is, why would you do it yourself on a 9 inch rear end housing? There are plenty of places out there making and selling rear end housings, and you can get them made to any specification that your car specifically needs. On top of that, why not just get a 9 inch housing out of a junkyard? There are several Ford cars that were produced over the years that have the correct width for a 9 inch housing that fits underneath an early classic Mustang. Well, the answer is correctness and cost. Now, I'm not too big on correctness. I mean, I'm putting a Jaguar rear end in my Mustang, so it doesn't have to be period correct for me. But for a lot of people, having a period correct 9 inch is a little more challenging because the 9 inch housings that came in 64 and a half through 66 have tapered axle tubes. Now, if you get a rear end, say, out of a Ford Granada, it'll be the correct width. You can throw that underneath the car, no problem, but it does not have the tapered axle tubes. And that's going to require different U-bolts, different mounting brackets for the leaf springs, and it's not going to be, quote, period correct. The other advantage of going DIY is cost savings. Like I said, plenty of places out there that'll narrow up a rear end for you. But getting one inexpensively is simply not going to happen. This video is about how I took a Ford 8-inch rear end, used the axles, the axle tubes, and then the center section out of a Ford 9-inch housing, and grafted that all together to make a period-correct Ford 9-inch rear end. So let's start by taking a look at the tools required to narrow a nine inch rear end at home. This right here is a nine and three eighths inch case. Now, for those of you not familiar with the nine and three eighths, it was something that Ford did in the late sixties and early seventies. They basically took the design of the Ford nine inch and they made it slightly bigger. You don't need a nine and three eighths to narrow a nine inch rear end. I'm using this 9 and 3 eighths because it was basically garbage. There's no replacement parts for them. You can't get any of the ring gear, pinion gear, bearings, any of that kind of stuff. What's nice about this and why I'm using a 9 and 3 eighths is because I had one. And as long as there's no ring gear on it, it will bolt up into any Ford 9 inch housing because the pattern is the same. So I took this rear end and I took all the guts out. And then I flip this over, I put in two machined pucks with a hole in the center that allows a one inch rod to be centered in these bearing locations. Then on the other end, two pucks to fit both of the common Ford bearing size. You have the smaller Ford bearing size, and then you have the larger Ford bearing size. And this simply goes into the end of the housing and gives you that same one inch hole to line this up with this and the other end up with this side. If I was the bigger bearing, I would have simply slid this into the bearing pocket and 
This puck is good to go with either size of bearing for a Ford 9 inch. The next tool is something I purchased called a dog bone. And this is what allows you to set the depth for your axles. This fits on the housing and then it shows you where the end of the axle needs to be. Now, having used this, having used line of sight and all that, I've decided that it's not a very good tool. I mean, it works fine for what it is. And I don't regret paying the 30 bucks or whatever it was I paid for it when I bought it. But I'd have been far better served to make my own. What I would have done is I would have taken a piece of steel that's five inches wide, and I'd have drilled four holes in it to match four spots on the rear end housing. I then would have taken a nine inch rear end that has the correct depth for the axles, and removed the center section, installed the axles, and then simply taken a piece of steel to fill this window and come up and be a positive stop in between the axles. When you're lining everything up and getting everything the correct depth and getting everything ready to weld the axle tubing in place, having to line this up by eye is just not a great option. But if I had a positive stop, something where I could just have the axle hit that positive stop, I would have been far better served and it would have been a DIY option. This is it. This is the basic kit that I put together to narrow a Ford 9 inch. I've done several Ford 9 inches using this and it works very, very well. The only thing that I would have done differently is rather than a one inch solid rod, I actually would have gone with like a one and a half, maybe a two inch, quarter inch tube, because it would be more rigid. There's actually a fair amount of flex in the one inch rod, more flex than I'd like there to be. And to overcome that, what I had to do was get everything lined up and then see how easily this puck slid into place. Like if, if things weren't lined up properly, it may have been down here. If I just shove it in, the springiness of the one inch rod doesn't actually line everything up perfectly and I had to do it all manually. If I went with that bigger tubing, I really think I'd have been better off. Now, I don't remember what the ID is for a Ford eight inch tapered rear end. I know there's at least an inch and a half in there. There may be room for a two inch tube. So that's the only thing that, you know, may or may not work well. Inch and a half for sure will fit. Two inch might be just a little too big. But had I done that, I think I'd have had a little more rigidity in this setup. So the donor housing for my Ford nine inch was actually a Ford nine and three eighths inch rear end. Good news is the carrier and bolt pattern is the same and all that had to be done was the housing had to be slightly notched to accommodate for the slightly larger ring gear. These rear ends are available in a lot of different applications. I actually took this one out of a 69 Country Squire. So this was the perfect donor because the center section was no good, but the housing itself was extremely strong. Also, it turned out really well for me that the ID on the original axle tubes that this rear end had just happened to be the same as the OD on my 8-inch rear end axle tubes. And so it made the whole process fairly simple and fairly straightforward. Now, as I said before, I've actually done this twice. I did this first with this heavier rear end housing. And then the second time I did it, I used a 9-inch rear end that came out of a 61 Galaxy. And the axle tubes on it were actually the same diameter as the 8-inch axle tubes. And so in that particular case, I ended up taking a slightly different technique. And we'll get to that in just a bit. The very first step in this project is to take a lot of measurements. Basically, we are copying the Ford 8-inch rear end that came out of this Mustang and we are replacing the center housing to facilitate a nine inch rear end. So I measured everything. I measured the width, I measured where the spring perches were located. Now all that should work out the same, but still I wanted to have reference. 
I also measured the pinion angle. I did this by drilling some holes in a piece of steel and affixing that piece of steel to the face of the housing and then using an angle finder to measure the angle. Now it's critical that whatever you are setting these rear ends up on is level in every direction. I used a couple of saw horses and I actually ended up having to use some shims to level them on one end because my garage floor was not level. Had I not taken this extra step prior to taking all my measurements on the 8 inch, it would have thrown things off and the end result would have been incorrect. Once I had all the information of exactly how this rear end needed to be put together, I took the 8 inch rear end apart. I cleaned up the tubes, got it ready to be assembled with the 9 inch housing. And then I also had to do some modification to the actual 9 inch housing. Now the first thing that I did is I drilled plug weld holes in the end of the tubing. And the reason I did that was because this is such a heavy duty 9 inch housing, the axle tubes that I cut off were significantly bigger than the 8 inch tubes that I'm going to be installing. To take up the difference, I left part of the original axle tubes attached to the housing. And I really wanted a direct connection from the actual 9 inch housing to the 8 inch axle tubes. And so the plug weld provides that connection. Now granted, we do have a connection between the axle tubes of the 9 inch and the axle tubes from the 8 inch. And those 9 inch axle tubes are directly connected to the housing but I just wanted a little extra strength. There's no reason in a situation like this not to overbuild. The next thing I had to do was deal with the fact that this housing had no fill plug. As I mentioned it originally came as a 9 and 3 8 rear end housing. And on a 9 and 3 8 the fill plug is actually part of the center section. But an actual 9 inch rear end does not have a fill plug in the center section. So I needed to add one to the housing. I did this simply by taking measurements on a different 9 inch rear end to find out exactly where the plug needed to go. Because the plug determines fluid level. And then I drilled a hole, welded a nut on the inside and tapped said hole. This gave me a nice place to add a fill plug. I also drilled a hole in the bottom and used the same technique, welding in a nut, although the nut had been notched to allow for fluid drainage, so that I had a drain plug. Now, 9 inch rear ends back in the day actually used to come with drain plugs, but Ford eliminated that due to cost savings. And it is so much nicer to drain the fluid out of a rear end by removing a drain plug than it is to do it by popping the differential out. There's no way to do that without making a terrible mess. So since I had it all apart, the drain plug seemed like an obvious choice. From there I was able to start the actual assembly process. The first thing I needed to do was set axle depth. Now this is where the dog bone comes in handy and as I mentioned in the tools section, in retrospect, I think I would have rather had a piece of steel jutting down between the axles to accomplish the same thing. But at the time, this is what I had, and so this is what I used. I did each side, one side at a time, not worrying about pinion angle, and just simply set the depth. Once I had the depth, I used tape on the 8-inch axle housing tubes to mark exactly where they needed to be in reference to the 9 inch housing that they were going to be welded to. From there, I was able to get it put together roughly and begin the process of setting the pinion angle. I could go into great detail of the importance of pinion angle. In this particular case, I did it to match the 8 inch housing that came out of the Mustang. And that is the easiest way to go. But if you're going to take the time to do a rear end like this, you may want to investigate further and make sure you're doing it correct for your application. Because things like having, say, a T5 transmission that hangs down a little further in the back can affect the overall pinion angle that you need at the rear end. With the housing width properly set and the pinion angle also properly set, the last thing I needed to do was properly align the bearings in the center section to the axle bearings at the end of the axle tubes. And this is where my DIY tool came in to play. I installed the 9 and 3 8 carrier that I had gutted 
with the pucks mounted in the bearing location and installed the one inch rod. From there, I adjusted how the axle housing was sitting so that I could easily slide the pucks into the axle housing. With everything lined up and everything in the correct position, I double checked everything. I measured again, I double checked pinion angle, I made sure that we had no movement, and then I tack welded the housing together. I'm a competent welder, and at the time I was using a lower end welder. And so once I had it tack welded, for me it made a lot more sense to take it to a certified welder. I could have welded it together and I'm sure it would have turned out fine, but it didn't cost me that much to have a certified welder go ahead and run a bead around each tube and fill those plug welds. And that's just a little peace of mind. I've been doing this long enough now and I do have a much better welder now. So if I was doing it again, I would probably just have run the beads myself. But at the time, this was money well spent because again, it didn't cost me that much. As I said before, I've done this on a couple of housings and the second housing I built, I actually used a period correct 60s center section and welded the eight inch tubes to it. And in that particular case, the tube diameter was the same for the axle housing tubes that came off the eight inch and the axle housing tubes that I cut off the nine inch. This meant that I couldn't easily slip the eight inch tubes into the nine inch housing like I'd done on my first build. Also, the axle tubes from the eight inch were not long enough for me to completely remove the axle tubes from the original nine inch and press them in as it was originally done. So what I ended up doing was sleeving the axle tubes. Again, I used plug welds and left a little bit of a gap so that the sleeve would be welded to both pieces and both pieces would be welded together. Ultimately, the result was a super strong rear end and it's just a little bit of insurance to use a sleeve like that to make sure that your rear end is plenty strong. My attitude anytime I'm DIYing anything is to overbuild. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a certified welder, and so if there's anything I can do to add extra strength, extra rigidity, I'm gonna do it to ensure that the car will be well built and safe. And that in a nutshell is my nine inch rear end build. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to put them down in the comments and I would love to get back to you. If you like what you've seen, please click like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. Thanks for watching.